Space Castle, not designed for pushing ice. Oh my goodness gracious, I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. Welcome to the Sword and Laser, and prepare to expand the scope of your knowledge across space and time, to absorb the vastness of an author's works, and plumb the depths of their inspiration. Wow. That was epic. All right. Uh, <laughs> we begin at the foundation. Open your mind to seven things you should know about Alistair Reynolds. What are you holding? Their minds. Oh, okay. Open. Okay. Reynolds has a doctorate in astronomy and worked as an astrophysicist at the European Space Research and Technology Center from 1991 until 2007. Alistair spent his early years in Cornwall. He has lived in England, Scotland, and the Netherlands, and now lives in his native Wales near Cardiff, possibly to be near the space-time rift the TARDIS sometimes refuels at. That makes sense. Yeah. Reynolds wrote the 2013 Doctor Who novel Harvest of Time, which tells a story from the era of the third Doctor, who was played in the television series by John Pertwee. The book includes the Doctor's companion, Joe Grant, and the Master as main characters. His first book, Revelation Space, came out in 2002. His second book, Chasm City, was set in the Revelation Space universe, but was more of a crime fiction take. It won the British Science Fiction Association Best Novel Award. Reynolds has been nominated for the Arthur C. Clarke Award three times for his novels Revelation Space, Pushing Ice, and How of Sun. Although his novels are parts of a series, Reynolds strives to make them enjoyable independently. He has said, I don't like picking up a book in the shop and finding it's the second part of a trilogy. He recommends reading Revelation Space, Redemption Arc, and Absolution Gap in order, but says he knows people who have enjoyed them in reverse order. The rest can be read in any order at all, which is kind of <laughs> madness. Reynolds has said, quote, It's often taken for granted that you can't have well-rounded characters in hard, nuts and bolts sci-fi stories, because by the time you've put all the science in, there's no room for characters. He says, I just don't see that as the case. And there's been plenty of good books over the years that have bucked that trend. Facts can only tell you so much, so what other facets of Reynolds should you know? Well, Aaron provides in a whiteboard. You want to know something about space? It's dark. As an astrophysicist for the European Space Agency, Alistair Reynolds has been pretty darn qualified to attest to this fact. The light, even from relatively bright stellar objects, is quickly swallowed by the vast distances between them. Betelgeuse, about 900 times the size of our sun, is only 642 light years away pittance in cosmic terms, but you can't even see the poor thing in the low glow of a typical SoCal night. We're not talking your garden variety gloom here. This is advanced darkness. Given this, it's maybe no surprise that it serves as such a rich metaphor in Reynolds' novels, such as his Revelation Space Saga. The darkness here is not just the cold of interstellar vacuum, but the severely pragmatic motivations which frequently doom both his human protagonist and the aliens they encounter. Think cold equations, but bigger. Often categorized as space opera, these would be the kind of operas with tragic clowns and viking-helmed ladies tossing themselves onto bonfires. Now it's not all grim. Pushing Ice, for example, serves up a classic technology-will-save-us survival tale, which foregrounds the redeeming power of science. His most recent novels in the Poseidon's Children series, too, focus on the ways in which commonplace values can complement grand designs like interstellar colonization. Humanity, in Reynolds' tales, may indulge in factional squabbles, like any family, but they pull together when the stakes are high enough. Darkness, it turns out, has its limits. At least if you remember your flashlight batteries. Well, so he could just, just use your cell phone. I mean, That's you don't a good need point. To use a Why don't you just pull out his phone? Yeah. That's all, all darkness. All problems. It really <laughs> solves all problems. Where do you charge your phone in space? Um... You could use a little solar. Port well, a little portable solar. Is that how close you are? Yeah, it would be the pretty weak, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Beetle well, juice, beetle juice. we have endeavored to prepare you for this moment. He is among us. <laughs> yes. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you so much. Hello. Now, we are all uh, Doctor Who fans here, um, and I know you are as well. But I was curious, are you a new Who fan? And if so, are you looking forward to the new season coming up? I'm hugely excited about it, but it's a bit of a wait, as far as I know. There's a few months to go before we're going to see the uh, the, the, the new guy in action. Uh, yeah. I like, you know, I've, Doctor Who's part of my DNA. I've grown up with it, and I love the old stuff. The new stuff is different, but if you can sort of tune into it and accept it for what it is, I think it's uh, it can be just as enjoyable. Who was your doctor growing up? Uh, it's, you know, how old, which Doctor Who was on when I was eight years old? That's the question you're basically asking. <laughs> I don't mean to age John you. John Pertwee, but... all the way. See, I love Pertwee, and Baker was my doctor growing up because I was eight years Baker old when too. Baker was on. But, Baker too. But he had uh, such a, um, a long tenure as the doctor. You know, I was kind of an adult almost by the time he finished. We also have uh, uh, some listener questions to get to, but I don't want to spend too much time on the Doctor Who stuff. 
but you've you've written in the Doctor Who universe. Is that something you'll be able to do again? You'd want to do again? Yeah, I, I, I definitely. I, I mean, I enjoyed it tremendously. It was just a blast from from start to finish writing a Doctor Who story, and I'd love to do another one. And I think the you know the will is there for me to do one if I should choose to do so. It's just a question of finding the time. Yes, yeah. quite a commitment, and I have to write my normal contracted novels as well. And finding the, the sort of window where I can sort of slot a Doctor Who novel into that is not as simple as it seems. But I, you know, I, I do hope I can do another one at some point. I was just curious, and I know you said no more Doctor Who questions, but I have one more. Is that no, okay? No, okay. it wasn't it. So, all right. So, when you do write in the Doctor Who universe, is it like other kinds of big franchise like organizations? Like we've talked to a lot of people who have written in the Star Wars universe or the Star Trek universe. How much collaboration do you have with like the Doctor Who people, or is it more just something that comes directly from you, and then you kind of clear the storyline with them? How tightly do you have to stay with with what's already gone on in the Doctor Who universe? We had to. Um, I had to write a synopsis and get that cleared by BBC Cardiff, which is where they make Doctor Who. Um, so I wrote a sort of two-page synopsis, and it, it, there was a you know a bit of to and fro in before they were happy with the, the content of the synopsis. But it's not, I, 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 you know, it's a very diff, different sort of universe than the sort of Star Trek or Star Wars universe of Doctor Who. It's never been internally consistent, and I think the, any attempt to write under the assumption that there's this sort of big bible of internal consistency that you have to stick to. Just doomed to failure. So there's a lot. I mean, I felt I had just a huge amount of creative leeway when I was writing it. I was just putting in loads of stuff that probably isn't canon. Yeah, yeah. But there's it was no fun. Canon. So I did it. Time but, you can know, be it, rewritten. Like, right. Forget yeah, the canon. Can <laughs> it must have been so fun to write John and Pertwee. Like the eight-year-old inside of you just must have been dancing with glee. It was worse than that because I had a I had like a John Pertwee action figure and a, and a, the master action figure on my computer the whole time I was writing it. You know. I was sort of like, Doctor, doctor, you know. <laughs> Playing out the parts. That's Let's be serious. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so for our first listener question, uh, we have one from James, and he wants to know how much of an influence do recent scientific discoveries uh, have on your work, and how much influence do you think science fiction has on the direction of science? I'm really interested in that whole question, the sort of interplay between science and science fiction. I, mean, it's, I think you can easily trace... Um, the sort of the flow of from science into science fiction, you'll get a, cu- a cool new idea, uh, like black holes, for instance, will, will, will crop up in science, and within a few years, science fiction writers will be scrambling to, to sort of use this idea in, in a sort of interesting way in the fiction. Um, and I, you know, I'm part of that process. I read the popular scientific press. I read New Scientist, Nature, Scientific American. Read the newspapers. And if I see something cool, I'll ferret that away. Um, as a possible story idea that I might be able to come to in a year or two, and sometimes that works. Uh, so I'm always on the lookout for sort of a, a little scientific tidbit that I that I think will be will be useful. Um, the other way, the sort of traffic from science fiction in terms of influencing science, it is there, but it's a lot harder to sort of uh, to map and to trace. But there's no doubt that generations of scientists have grown up reading science fiction. Not all of them, but uh, certainly that that is the case. But I think one of, one of the things that science fiction is good at is giving science a kind of toolkit to use to think about big concepts. Um, you know, you think about something like terraforming, taking the surface of an alien planet and making it Earth-like. Well, terraforming is a, a word that came from science fiction, but it's now almost part of the respectable scientific dialogue when they talk about, you know, things we might do on Mars or on Venus, and even geoengineering, you know, coming back and sort of fixing the Earth. So... That's just, a, just, just an example of the way a bit of concept from science fiction sort of migrated into science, but there are, there are others. But it's a little bit harder to test that, uh, to track those uh, connections. I think, interestingly, too, I think a lot of uh, design things have been informed by early science fiction. We're seeing a lot of devices, you know, especially things like clamshell flip phones that have been informed by, by early s- product design, like in things like Star Trek, the next generation with the communicators. So it's, it's funny how that stuff kind of comes back as well. That actually leads us to another question. Uh, Mal wants to know if there's a technology, a location, or an idea from your books that you wish could be real. Well, you know, you have the sort of ideas fall into sort of two or three categories. You have things like hyperspace travel, or faster than light travel. I mean, yes, wouldn't that be cool? But realistically, it's not going to happen. And even, you know, even interstellar travel, even if you sort of stick within the, the the constraints of Einstein, it's highly unlikely that we're going to have interstellar travel anytime soon. 
So I think I, t- you know, I prefer to think about sort of technologies that are a little bit closer to home. And I, I mean, I, I personally would love uh, s- sort of really seamless telepresence technology, which I've sort of used in some of the books, some of the recent books in particular. The idea that rather than um, physically traveling somewhere, what if you could project your, you, you could feel as if you were physically present uh, by perhaps embodying a robot or even maybe hacking into the nervous system of another, of another human being with their permission, of course. But, you know, I think yeah. something like that, maybe, maybe not too far off. Um, I mean, sort of telepresence or telerobotics is a lot, there's a lot more happening uh, than people are generally aware of. And the price is coming down. You know, you can get into telerobotics for about $1,000 now. So there are, there are things happening. It's all a bit fringe. It's all a bit niche, but there are definitely things happening. It's a little bit like the early days of the internet. Yeah, that would make interviews a lot easier. Yeah, we could have had you yeah. here at the table. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all, I'm, I almost feel like I'm there anyway, but you know, we, I mean, we're almost yeah, stuff. we're that close, right? It's yeah. it's weird, isn't it? It's sort of breaking down the barriers of distance. Yeah. We just got to update the firmware on the space castle. Yeah. And exactly. Then, yeah, that's really all we need to Lem's do. Lem's compiling the new code. Oh, right okay. Now, so, oh, so, so we're, it's, it's season three. Yeah, maybe. Okay, good. Um, is it, <laughs> that, that's the other part of Mao's question, actually, is. What do you think, which technology that exists in your novels do you think is the closest to actually coming to fruition? Is it telepresence like that? It is, but it's, you know, it's not an idea that I'd point to and say, well, this is something I invented wholesale for my books. I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time reading, as I said, popular science. And, uh, you know, I've read articles in New Scientist about telepresence, telerobotics. And it's just one of those things you think, mm, I'm not really seeing enough of this in science fiction at the moment, so I'll try and get a little bit ahead of the pack. Um, so, you know, so there are ideas that you, you sense are already out there, but maybe aren't being discussed or utilized sufficiently in science fiction. And in, in that sense, I'm always keen to be, you know, one of those writers who sort of gets on that particular bandwagon a little bit sooner. Excellent. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit, we have a question from Sean. And this is a question that's come up a few times with some of our authors in the UK. Uh, but he wants to know, how come your books come out months later in the US than Britain? Doesn't your American publisher realize how cheap <laughs> it is to import the British versions into the States? I, I did it. Blue Remembered Earth, I bought from the UK. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, I get it. It's a real pain. And it's just, um, in, particularly in my case, it's a sort of historical uh, time lag that we've just been locked into from almost from the first book. Um, it, it's, it's been very difficult to sort of catch up. And when we got close at one point, um, I think we got relatively close with the American edition of Blue Remembered Earth, actually. There was, a, there was much less uh, lag between the British and American editions. But we've fallen behind again now. And, it, it, you know, I, I, I feel genuinely sorry for readers who have to put up with this. Um, this time lag. There's not, it's not really anyone's fault. It's certainly not the fault of the American publisher. But yeah, it's, it's something I think we're all aware that it would be great if, um, if we could get closer to synchronous publication. And hopefully in the future we can get somewhere nearer that. But we, you know, it, it's something that we're moving towards and that we're aware that it's, uh, it's annoying. Uh, Sean wants to know if you have plans for the next book after the Poseidon's Children trilogy. He wants to know if you're turning to re- returning to Revelation Space or, or is there something new on the horizon? I never think more than one book ahead. Uh, I, I, each book, the, the next book is always to some extent a bit of a reaction against the one I've just been working on. I, you know, I might feel like a change of pace, a change of scenery. Um, the, the book, I'm currently working on the last of the Poseidon's Children's books. It's quite a big, expansive thing, which takes us out into the galaxy and it's, it deals with alien contact and uh, you know, lots of different solar systems. Um, whether the next book would, would, you know, it might be something where I might go operate on much a, quite a smaller scale. I don't really know, and I probably won't know until I'm a bit nearer the end of this one. Uh, I certainly am going to return to the Revelation Space Universe. I mean, I, I say that all the time, uh, but I, I mean it sincerely in, in that I, I feel that it's not something that I put to put in a box and I don't want to ever touch again. I, I genuinely enjoy writing in that universe. Um, I'm working on a short story at the moment in the Revelation Space Universe, which is purely to keep my hand in. It's to keep keep me sort of uh, invested in the universe and to remind myself where where all the bits go, so that if I want to do more, you know, like a novel, then you know, then it's all sort of fresh in my head. But there are no firm plans at the moment. Um, it'll be you know probably sometime uh, towards the end of this year when I need to think about the next book. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I'm sure fans will be excited just to hear even that you plan on returning to that to that place. That's, that's awesome. Uh, our next question comes from Sandy. She says, it seems like my favorite current science fiction authors such as yourself, Ian MacDonald and Peter F. Hamilton, are from the UK and Ireland. Uh, what do you think the reason is for the proliferation of authors from these countries in the SF market? Are, are British publishers just more receptive to hard science fiction than perhaps in other places? I, I don't know. I mean, I think we all have uh, individual stories. We all came into science fiction through different routes and for different reasons. Um, there's, there's certainly a generation of writers in the UK who owe a lot of their success to the existence of the British magazine Interzone, mm. which started off in the early 80s. And I sort of, you know, I became aware of it pretty early on in its existence. And it was a major mission of mine to break into Interzone. And I did. And through that, uh, you know, initial couple of stories, I made contacts, which served me very well 10 years later when I was trying to sell a novel. So, you know, there, there is certainly a, a wave of writers who probably wouldn't necessarily be around uh, were it not for Interzone. Maybe they would have found a way to publish it anyway, but Interzone certainly had, a, had an important effect. But then, like, Peter Hamilton didn't come through Interzone, so there are always exceptions. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 mean, I grew up reading um, predominantly American science fiction, and some of my favorite American writers, round about, I guess, the sort of early, mid-90s, some sort of seemed, seemed to t turn away from doing the kind of big cosmic stuff, you know, the big scope SF. They, they, they started doing techno thrillers or stuff, other mm. stuff. Um, you know, and as a reader, I was like, why? You know, come on, just give us the stuff we want, guys. You know, we, we don't want to, we don't want near future techno thrillers. We want galactic adventures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in a way, I think, you know, there was suddenly there was an opportunity there for, for, for um, a, you know, a new wave of writers to sort of slip in and, and you know, start supplying what the market wanted. Yeah, well, it's like, yeah, it seems like it's kind of coming back around a little bit because we have authors yeah. like James S.A. Corey, for example, who are going into like the really big space opera kind of themes. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe that's changing. It's, it always comes back. Yeah. You know, there's never, but there isn't someone doing big space opera. Right, right. Uh, Elf points out that your books are incredibly visually descriptive and wants to know if you think any will ever be made into films or television. Well, there's, there's never a point where there isn't some... Uh, you know, low-level discussion about TV or film. It's just always going on. Um, but to date, nothing has ever got to the point where I felt it sufficiently motivated to tell anyone. Um, but, you know, you just, you just keep your fingers crossed and you hope that at some point one of these uh, lines of inquiry will, will, will bear fruit. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a little bit more interest with each passing year. Um, but, you know, if I say anything, I'll probably jinx it. Right, right. <laughs> We don't want to be the ones who ruin that no, for you, so not. maybe we yeah. should just stop talking about it now. <laughs> nice if it happened, and who knows? We'll, we'll just put a plea out there, like, someone make it happen, please. Right, we want yeah, to see that, make that happen. Yeah. Our next question comes from Elise, and I'm paraphrasing her question, but she loves your strong female characters and wants to know if you set out to create them that way, like this story needs a strong female character, or if they just kind of develop into that style of woman. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sort of... Uh kind of an organic writer and I don't generally set out with a clear idea of where I'm going when I start writing which it gets me into terrible trouble because sort of three months later I realize I haven't got a clue what I'm, <laughs> what I'm, you know, why am I writing this story uh, but I often don't start with a clear idea of the character uh, the central character in the story and the characters sometimes uh, you know I, I, I have written half a book um, with a viewpoint character of say a particular gender then be like it's just not working and I go back and change the gender and something clicks. So it's that haphazard. Um, you know, so there, there are, there's, there's no sort of, sort of um, formula that I use or sort of method. But, um, you know, I do try and get a, a, as far as possible away from the idea that uh, the female characters are really just of action, you know, gun-toting babes who are there um, as, you know, they're essentially, you know, female stand-ins for male action roles. I, you know, I'm not really interested yeah. in doing um, but it's not for me to say sort of how successful I am. I mean, I, I just, um, when I when I worked at the European Space Agency, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues were women, a lot of them were, you know, extremely competent, um, clever um, scientists and engineers, many of whom were very, very good at lots of other things. You know, they lots, lots of them had sort of pilot's licenses, or um, I, I was very into um, riding horses, and, you know, many, many of my friends were uh, scientists, engineers who were, <laughs> also could ride horses as well. So when I wrote um, Pushing Ice, where the two central protagonists are both women, it was sort of 
vying for control of this spacecraft, which ends up um, being sucked into the future. Um, you know, each of those characters was a kind of composite of about three or four different um, women that I that I knew or worked with uh, on a professional basis. And you know, once I'd written a draft of the book, I I, I showed it to to three or four of them, and you know, they read it, and a number of them had observations. It, you know, they, she wouldn't do this mm-hmm. in this situation. You know, and when you get sort of the same point coming up more than once, you know that they're onto something. You need to think about it carefully. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the almost a gender swapping within a the development of a story because that's kind of brought along like two of the most strong sci-fi female characters in history. Like Ripley from Alien was originally written as a male character, I believe, and also Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica. Of course, right. the original series was a male. Um, so I just I think it's interesting that. It can be it can be swapped so easily, and yet that has such a profound impact on 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 how the characters are made and, and perceived. Very much so, and there are other sort of choices you make at the start of a narrative, like point of view and tense. That sometimes, I mean, speaking for myself, um, I often get it wrong, and, I, and you know, halfway through the story, it's just not catching fire, and I, you know, you, you tweak a few of these parameters, and suddenly it sort of clicks into place. Um, but yes, check the, the gender of a character as well is uh, one of those things that sometimes you. With the best will in the world, you just get it wrong, and you realize, or you don't. Sometimes you don't realize. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's good if you do realize, because then you can try and fix it. Yeah. Uh, Electric uh, is a fan of the Mass Effect games and wants to know if you feel there's a kinship between the story told there and Revelation Space. I I don't know enough about. I mean, I do hear from people who say, "Have you you know do you play Mass Effect? Do you know that there's sort of common elements in the storylines that seem r- remind people of stuff in my books?" And I mean, you know, I'm like. I, I genuinely don't know what to make of it because um, I often speak to readers and they say, you know, I really like that idea about slower than light spaceships or um, von Neumann machines or something like that. And I say, well, you know, um, all I'm doing is playing with a big sandbox of ideas that I've inherited from a whole bunch of other writers who were maybe active before me. Um, many hard SF writers, you know, people like Greg Bentford, Joe Haldeman, Greg Bear, and then going back into the earlier writers like um, Cordwain and Smith, people like that. You know, and often, you know, this is by no means a universal statement, but a lot of readers have not read that deeply into the genre. So what they see is, um, they'll see an idea in my books and they think, well, that's, that's really original. But I say, no, no, I'm just... I nicked that off so and so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Took that from Zelazny, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just wonder, you know, with, with video games, it's not just Mass Effect, but I wonder, you know, maybe the guys behind the video games have just read a lot of science fiction. Oh, I'm sure. They're just riffing off the same idea set that I am. Yeah, Who it knows? just becomes absorbed into the, you know, the, the collective yeah. consciousness of, yeah. of sci fi fans. And well, World of Warcraft is a great example where they avow it. I mean, you can tell they're making puns on the names for various novels and franchises. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's how, actually half the fun of playing the yeah. game. Um, and then finally, for viewer questions, uh, Ben wants to know what is the best example of an Al Reynolds book? Uh, you know, what is, where, where would you suggest new readers really dive in? Right. Um, well, I mean, you, I think you always have a few personal favorites. Um, you know, I, I, obviously, I'm very pleased with the most recent, whatever the most recent book is. Sure. <laughs> he said. But um, I'm a particular fan of House of Sons, which was a, sort of a midway through my, my career, I suppose, because uh, it was a book that um, I, I, people were beginning to say he does all this dark, gothic, you know, gloomy, tech noir science fiction. And I thought, well, Yes, I've done that, but I don't want to be defined by it. And House of Sons was an attempt to write something that's much more expansive and colorful. And, to, you know, it's a little bit more optimistic in tone than some of the earlier stuff. And it's just one of those novels that once I wrote it, it was just a breeze. I mean, it just wrote itself mm. with very few hiccups. And I had a lot of fun writing it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's one of those universes that I wouldn't mind revisiting. Uh, so I think that one's, you know, it's a standalone as well. So if you, if you, if you don't like it, you've only, you've only wasted <laughs> You know, that part of your life, you don't have to read sort of four or five books in a, in a linked sequence before deciding whether to carry on. Uh, so, yes, yeah, House of Sons, I think, is a good starting point. Pushing Ice, again, is, is another standalone that I quite, you know, I'm, I'm fairly fondly uh, disposed to. Obviously, read them all, but where to start? That's right. A good there way you to, go. That's a good that's, way to. That's very diplomatic. That's a good way to put it. All right, we got a, a couple of our super questions for you. Are you prepared? I am. I, I hope I am. Okay, I think you are. Um, this is one we've asked a few of the authors on the show. What sci-fi or fantasy trope do you think 
just really needs a rest for a while. Just kind of put it to the side and let it breathe. <laughs> let yeah, it rage. Uh, yeah. D dystopian futures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the grim dystopian future. Uh, I, you know, I love it. I, I can really enjoy a good dystopian future, but I think that we've just had too many of them recently. Um, and I'm saying this as someone who recently watched The Hunger Games and thought it was a really good film. I really sure. enjoyed it. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, I think we need the dial to point a little bit more in the sort of optimism direction. Not a sort of happy, clappy, shiny utopia, but yeah. just a sense that it isn't necessarily going to be horrible. I've read that they are, uh, I think we talked about this on the audio show once, how, you know, authors start writing dystopian futures or utopian futures based on the current current economic standing of, of you know, the mm -hmm. country they're living in at that time. And it, it's a weird, like, outlook thing for the future. And that yeah. change is based on, on the economic, you know, prosperity of, of their current, current time. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, I, I actually really like the stories. And I actually feel Blue Remembered Earth was was in this category of neither utopian nor dystopian. It's just topian. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, I tried to, there's got to be a word, isn't there? Yeah, it's yeah. Middletopia. You know. yeah. Middletopia. Med, I like that. Middletopia. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Middletopian. And then our final super question. Uh, you can save one book from the burning library of everything. What would it be? Oh, well, oh dear. Um... That's your your own are all safe. We'll just yeah, we'll kind yeah, of bracket we'll just, that yeah. off. No, no, I'll take I'll take. Uh, I don't. I mean, I've, I've asked this before, and I don't know if they do. Like, if, can you get like the complete works of Dickens in sure, one that, volume? Yeah, you could. Well, we'll yeah? call that. I'll have yeah. that then. Please. Box set. Perfect. Box set of Dickens. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, Alistair, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yes, and uh, On the Steel Breeze, the second in the Poseidon Children series, came out September 26, 2013. So make sure you go grab it. That's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there's lots. Join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com and subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>